Second, cool. All right, can you guys hear me? Cool, how's it going? So uh, yeah, my name's Brad Newman. Uh, I'm an AI engineer at Anki, and uh, I just wanna tell you guys a little bit about um, Anki Overdrive, which is our latest product, and a little bit about the kind of problems we're trying to solve and uh, what we're doing at Anki. Uh, but first, a little bit of background on me. Um, so I uh, got into robotics. Uh, I started at Carnegie Mellon in undergrad, uh, working on these like low-cost robots, a uh, little platform we developed, and then, uh, I was uh, enrolled in the Robotics Institute. I started working on sort of uh, larger outdoor systems, doing uh, originally 3D perception. Um, there's like a tiny little bench there that's impossible to see. Uh, and then uh, detecting people, uh, change detection. Um, then in grad school, I started sort of shifting more towards motion planning, uh, dealing with dynamic obstacles. So like um, this PR2 is trying to plan through a hallway where people are driving around. Um, and while I was at CMU, I met uh, Boris Softman, who is the CEO and one of the founders of Anki. And um, I came out in 2012 to do a summer internship, and they never let me leave. So uh, I've been working at Anki since then. Um, in 2013, uh, we announced uh, Anki Drive uh, on stage at the uh, Apple WWDC keynote, where we did a demo. Um, and then uh, shortly after that, we were on sale, originally in Apple stores, with uh, Anki Drive. Um, and then just this year, we released Anki Overdrive, which is the second generation of the product. Um, so Anki Drive, uh, how many people are familiar with this? Cool. All right. That's improving year by year. That's good. Um, so uh, I'll show you the Overdrive video. So this is a product you can buy it in stores now. Um, you, the idea is you build a, a track out of these modular pieces and you have self-driving cars that uh, drive around and race, but uh, you can also control them. Um, and it's a, we, we're using robotics and AI technology to bridge the gap between the physical and virtual worlds um, in what a lot of people are now calling like a toys to life category. So these are the cars, which are tiny little robots. And then there's a free app that you download in the App Store and also on Android. Um, and there's sort of uh, characters you can play against. You can control one of the cars. You can play against AI characters. And you can play against your friends. Um, so one of the first things that it does is it maps out the track that you built, which I'll explain uh, more in a bit. Um, and then uh, the cars line up automatically. And uh, you can play a game. So it's kind of uh, like a Mario Kart, but in the real world, with like a futuristic vibe kind of a thing. Um, and so the idea behind the company was really uh, you know, it was three PhD students from Carnegie Mellon um, who uh, were working on all these different kinds of robotics projects, and we really wanted to like bring this to the masses. Like, what can we do to get? Like, how can we ship a million like smart robots? Um, and uh, I think it's pretty cool because we, in my opinion, at least we sh we shipped the first self-driving car. It's uh, it's only this big, but um, yeah. So uh, so we basically saw entertainment as a really good starting point because. Um, toys really haven't progressed at all. I mean, you see like they have some lights and some motors, and maybe you can RC it with an app, but there's really like no intelligence there, whereas video games have really taken off and become sophisticated. Um, so by using robotics to understand what's going on in the physical world, we can bridge that gap. So uh, in order to do that, we need to know what's going on in the world and where the cars are. So um, to simplify this product, the original version of Drive had a flat sort of vinyl mat so we knew the map ahead of time. Um, so basically, slowly by slowly, we're kind of solving more complicated problems. So uh, in Overdrive, we have these modular track pieces. So we're still somewhat limited in that you can't build anything at all in the world. But you can now assemble these things into 3D shapes. 
and uh, you can buy accessory kits which have like extra pieces, and then you can build bigger, crazier things. So you can uh, build basically for not that much money, you could build something that would like take up this whole room. Um, so the first thing that happens is, uh, yeah. So in order to do anything, we need to know where the cars are and what's going on in the world. So we have uh, these modular track pieces, um, and the the idea was to keep this all very low cost, right? So we're very like constrained and limited by that, but it also creates a lot of interesting problems. Um, so the pieces themselves are basically just plastic pieces. Um, I should have brought one. Oh well. Uh, and they have special ink on top that's IR transparent. So the black part is uh, infrared transparent. And underneath the black part, uh, we have a special system of lines and codes that we uh, came up with, and we print on the, on the pieces. So it's basically just a, a stamped piece. You print some codes, and then you print some special ink on top of it, and you act, attach some magnetic connectors to the outside. Um, so to zoom in a little bit on what uh, one of these codes looks like, uh, there's, a, there's what we call the follow line, which is this kind of line here. And so in the most basic mode, the cars are just line-following robots. They're driving around the track, and they're staying on the track for you automatically. Um, and then we have these kind of uh, barcode type system to uh, encode position. So you can see a thin bit would be like a zero, a thick bit would be a one. Um, and you can use that to, as the car's scanning those to figure out where the car is. Um, so the way that works is uh, underneath the car is a uh, camera right here with a special lens. It's basically like a selfie cam from a smartphone. And it has an infrared LED um, and this sort of little shield so it blocks out most of the light. And so it just looks down at the track. Um, and what it actually does is you can do something kind of cool with these cameras, which is you can get like a window. So these are rolling shutter cameras. So normally uh, you'd get whatever your frame rate is, maybe like 30 hertz or 60 hertz. But uh, a lot of cameras have this feature where if you give it like a small window, you can sample that much faster. So what we actually do is we have this whole camera, but we just take one row of pixels that we can sample at 500 hertz. Um, and we use that uh, for controls so that we can run a controller that will keep the car on the line um, at fairly high speeds. So we just use that one code. And then in order to map that, um, or in, sorry, in order to localize, as we're driving, we're scanning this code. So you drive past that, and you see you know, uh, uh, basically a binary code. And then the cars themselves have uh, like an ARM microprocessor on them, fairly low power. but um, So they don't really know what's going on. They just know, I saw this code. And then it's up to the app, which is running on the phone, to do the more sophisticated uh, processing. So what the vehicle sees um, is essentially something like this, which it has to make sense of. Um, OK, so why is this hard? Uh, you guys probably can imagine a lot of this stuff already. But first of all, I mean, the cars are never going perfectly straight. They're always some, there's something going on in the physical world. You know, the, it's bumpy. There's, you know, someone's poking them, someone's kicking them. Uh, you can get uh, blurry, like ambiguous line thickness, especially at the borders. Uh, noise in the image from you know, cat hair, dirty tracks, smudges, whatever might happen in a, in a kid's, you know, playroom. Um, floor patterns can look like lines. So other things in the world can sort of trick this system into thinking that they're part of the system. Um, and the, one of the biggest limitations is that we have no memory to keep past scans. So, I mean, if you guys look at this picture, you can say, oh, how easy is that? Like, do some image processing on that. But the cars can actually only see one row of pixels at a time. And uh, maybe two. We don't have enough memory to store more than like two rows of pixels at a time on the cars. So they have to do all their processing, uh, you know, one at a, one row at a time to figure out what's going on. Another complication happens during horizontal motion. So while you're playing the game, if you're controlling one of the cars, it'll automatically stay on the track for you, which is cool because it can go really fast. And if you were trying to steer around the turns, there's no way you'd be able to do it. So we can kind of give you this assistive. Uh, control. So when you tilt, what happens is it brings you sort of towards the inside or outside, so you can control your position on the road. Um, so while that's happening, uh, the the car is kind of moving sideways, and you're seeing uh, the 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 motion go that way. So you can track as the lines are moving. You can track the horizontal motion, but it becomes really hard to see the codes while that's happening. Um, also, crazy stuff that the cars do. Uh, make it really hard to track. So you know you can do these 180 turns, 
And basically, uh, you know, we, we looked at this and we tried to maybe process what was going on in this. But given the super limited amount of memory, we can't, and we also have really low bandwidth. We use Bluetooth low energy. So we can't send all this information up to the phone. So basically, we just don't even try to localize while this stuff is happening. Um, cool. So once we have this code, so the car read, I'm at 4.3, whatever that means, um, it sends that up to the phone using Bluetooth low energy. And the one phone, regardless of how many players there are, there's one phone who's the host. And that phone communicates to all the cars. So that phone is just collecting information about what the cars are seeing. Um, and it knows that uh, 4, 3, so in this case, maybe 4 means which type of piece am I on. So it knows it's on a, a straight piece, a certain kind of straight piece. Um, and then 3 might mean like where and which direction it's going. So now we know that the car was here, at least when it scanned that, that code. Um, so that's not terribly useful in the modular track case. So in Anki Drive, that was, all, that was the end of the story, because we, there was a globally unique kind of code for the whole track. So as long as we scan it correctly, that's the end of the story. Um, for Overdrive, we first have to do mapping before we can uh, do any of this. So basically, we collect, uh, as the cars are driving, a bunch of sort of sh a string of which pieces they're seeing from each of the cars. And then we combine all of that uh, into basically what we think, what map we think makes the most sense. So you can actually see it while the app's running. And that flicker you saw was because it was switching between uh, what it thought the longest track was from one car or another car. Um, and because of noise and issues, uh, sometimes it will read something wrong and it has to drive around uh, an extra lap or something to correct it. But the idea is that by using information from all the cars, we can come up with like, the most likely map. And once that map uh, closes, once it seems like a proper track, then we can start the game. And once we know the map, then we can do localization. Um, another sort of wrinkle in this is that the pieces aren't necessarily unique anymore. Um, so in, in this case, these arrows are like which way it's assembled. So you could take this whole piece and flip it around, and that would look different. Um, and in this case, we've got like two number sevens and two number twos, because there's a, a limit on how many pieces we can produce. Um, so if you're trying to localize on this, if, you, if the car reads that it's on piece number one, that's like an easy case, right? There's only one piece number one. It knows where it is. Um, but if it reads that it's on piece number seven, then it could be in either of those two cases. And depending on how the user built the track, which piece number, there actually is like a tiny little mark, but they're not supposed to know about that. Like that's not something they need to worry about. So we just need to handle it by, okay, now we see number two, we still don't know, but then once we scan number eight, we can narrow it down. And this is of course is ignoring all of the uncertainty that we have to handle in this as well. Um, which I won't go into too much detail on. But uh, basically, you know, you have something like this. It can be really easy to, you know, you scan this row of pixels. Well, is that a thin line? Is that a thick line? It can be hard to figure out what's going on. Um, so once we do that, we know when the car finishes the scan, we know where it is. So, you know, at t equals 0, maybe it's there. t equals 1, it's there. But what about at 0 0.5, right? We need to have a, we need to know where the cars are at any time, or at least provide that illusion to the user. So the way we do that is by um, keeping a virtual simulation of what's going on in the world that we try to keep up to date. So this simulation is stored on the phone. So when we get that scan from the car, the phone will incorporate that information and come up with its estimate of where the car is. And it also, we have encoders on the wheels, so we also know the uh, velocity of the car at that point. So basically what we can do is, uh, you know, if time's moving this way, we get a position update, and then we know where the car is. And we also have to model this latency, right? So there's communications latency here that we're also taking into account. Um, then the car drives some amount. And at the same time, the simulation is trying to match that. But uh, you can kind of see it's like a little bit off in this case. It's, in the wrong, it's on the wrong side of the road. So uh, what will happen is uh, once we do get another scan, the car will send a position update, and that will kind of update the, the simulation so that we're kind of using the information to correct our simulation of what's going on. And what that allows us to do is to create virtual items. So uh, you know, on the, this is the, the view of the game pads. Like while you're in the game, this is what you see on the screen. Um, and so uh, the cars are equipped with weapons and special items. So he's got a pulse carbine. So what happens is the user taps that button, and we simulate a pulse carbine rifle, which has like some cone of damage. And if it's a hit, then we can, we can display that physically by flashing lights. 
and uh, also by the movement of the cars, so the cars can wobble or, or do whatever. And in the game, what you have like energy, so if you, if you get damaged, you lose your energy and you have to pull over and, and recharge. So we can create that kind of like items uh, and virtual, virtual items experience. Um, and just like a video game, you know, these days it's all about upgrades and uh, getting more power-ups and things like that. So we have um, all of these different, you can get like a chain gun or a Vulcan chain gun. And you can also get special items. So you can get one which is like the, the crazy Ivan. Uh, it actually causes the car to flip around 180, drive backwards for a bit, and then flip back around so you can like get behind uh, your enemy. Uh, photon anchor. God, who came up with these names? Uh, photon anchor is like a, like a tractor beam. So it like slows down the car in front of you. So basically, as you're playing the game, you get that sort of video game experience of upgrading your cars. Um, and also new in Overdrive uh, is the idea of like we have a tournament. So there's a, a single player uh, mode you can play. So you can play, your friends can control the cars, or you can now play this like basically a story mode. So we, uh, we, have, we work with a bunch of people that come from like a video game background and like a creative background. So uh, we, we work with those guys to come up with this, story, with this uh, basically story. So we have these different characters, like these are the... Uh, these are the stock car crew. It's set in 2046, where there's like weird little robots like that guy. Um, and then we've got like you know the the cops with the cybernetically enhanced dog. And the idea is that uh, each of these uh, commanders has a different personality. So they have a voice. Like we actually have voice actors and stuff. But um, they also drive differently. So the you know Rufus is his name. Um, and uh, he's like just a mad bomber. Like he drives around kind of wildly and like drops bombs at you. Whereas uh, you know some of the other characters are uh, like more reckless or more cautious, and they have different traits. Um, there's uh, I forget what these are called. These are like the racers, I guess. So they would be like more kind of careful. Like this guy's like the sniper, so he kind of like lays back and like waits for the right shot. At least that's the idea. Um, these are the, there's a little monkey. These are like the military guys. Um, what else do we have? The assassins. And uh, of course, we've got like these evil, uh, what are they called? Xeros Corporation, which is like trying to like take over the world and use robots for evil. Um, unlike Anki, which is trying to use them for good. We actually wrote ourselves into our own video game. Um, cool. So uh, yeah, so a very a little bit about how this all works. So basically, um, one of the interesting challenges for me was, uh, you know, I've did robotics, and I can think about writing some kind of optimal plan or some kind of you know optimizing with respect to some well-known cost function. But really, when it comes to these kind of games, like you want them to be fun and you want them to be engaging, and they're also changing all the time. Like the game designer will come over and say, "Okay, uh, you've got three missiles," and so I put that in my state space, and they say, "Oh no, no, no! It's a machine gun with continuous energy," and it's like they're changing their minds every two weeks. So uh, what I came up with was I split the AI into sort of three parts. So the, there's a behavior system at the top level, which is a, sort of like a traditional video game, uh, like finite state machine system, which is then driving the item use, which is the, using the weapons and, and special items, which is also kind of like a video game system. It's just like a greedy evaluation. And then the planning, which uh, is more like robotics inspired, because it needs to run quickly. It needs to deal with dynamic obstacles, all the kinds of problems that we, that we need to deal with. Um, so the, the behavior system basically allows you to do things like level of difficulty. Um, so for example, the easier commanders, they're like a bit adaptive. So they can be in an aggressive state, which is like they're following you closely and they're shooting you a lot. And then if they're doing too well, they can transition to a more passive state where they're kind of uh, not following you as closely, not shooting as often. Um, that turned out to not be, uh, yeah, so then they can go back and forth between these two states and that can make it like a bit adaptive. Uh, that turned out to not be easy enough. So then we added something like a sitting duck state, which is like if you're doing really bad, the car will actually try to drive in front of you to like line up for a shot so you can do some damage to it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's still, I mean, we had to, I spent more time working on like the easiest AI than the hardest one because uh, making it easy without seeming dumb is difficult, right? Like you don't want us to have a random behavior that looks totally stupid. You want the user to feel like it was clever and, and good, but they're, they bested it, right? Um, Another cool thing that we can do with this system, which is hard to do with, I think, like a more traditional uh, system, is that we can add like specific rules for specific cases. So we have this uh, closing gap behavior. So we had this problem where if you build an oval um, and you have two players, 
a lot of times what'll happen is they'll both just be going as fast as possible on the opposite side of the track, and it gets really boring. Um, so like a, a video game, like a racing game, we call this rubber banding. So the idea is we can just detect that state, and instead of trying to make our planners solve for that and op everything all work perfectly, we can just stick a state into the state machine, detect that state, run like a canned behavior that slows down, and uh, resume the game. So uh, for the actual planning, the, the planning just thinks about the positions uh, of the cars and the speeds. It doesn't think at all about the items. So the idea is the, the high-level system tells the planner, here's what I need you to do based on whatever's going on in the game. And then the planner is just responsible for figuring out the, the trajectory. Um, so our state space, we've got current lane and distance along the track. So a lot of this is limited by the way we communicate with the cars. So we can't just come up with a set of waypoints and feed them to the cars because we're so limited on bandwidth and we're limited on what the cars can physically do. So our, our action space is just to tell the cars to shift lanes or to speed up or slow down. So uh, we sort of take that into account in the state space as well. Um, and also we need to think about time because we have dynamic obstacles, all the other cars are moving, and the speed that the, the car is going as well. Uh, the goals, basically there's two different kinds of goals. So um, sometimes, uh, oh, so I didn't explain this. There's different game modes you can play. So there's like a race, which is like get around the track as fast as possible. But because of the weapons and items, you can also do like a battle or king of the hill game where your goal is actually to like do damage with your weapons to other players. So um, sometimes, based on what the high level AI decides it wants to do, you want to get ahead as quickly as possible, which is just basically we use like a receding horizon kind of uh, get as quickly as you can to this line that's you know, constantly moving as, as the car is driving. Um, other times what you want to do is actually you have a moving goal. So you want to get behind a car into some specific position based on what items you have and what your personality traits are. Um, so uh, the search uh, basically uh, simultaneously searches towards all of these different goals. And uh, the reason we did it that way is because you don't know ahead of time like what solutions you're going to find. So for example, the cars have a minimum speed. So like you have a special item which allows them to stop temporarily, but generally they're always moving along the track. So if you're trying to get behind a car that's behind you and you're both going the minimum speed, it's not going to find us. The only solution would be to go all the way around the entire track and get behind them, but that's going to be beyond the horizon that our planner can think about. So it's going to fail in that case. So basically we have uh, a bunch of different possible goals and we don't know which one we're going to want ahead of time. So uh, we have to deal with, what do we have to deal with? We have to deal with dynamic obstacles. Uh, those are actually the only obstacles we have because the way the state space is set up, the, we basically flatten the entire track into like what looks like a big rectangle. So there's, the walls aren't really obstacles, it's just the other cars. Um, the other weird thing is that the actions are location dependent. So you know, normally you'd think about, okay, I've got my action, which is like move left, which always, it doesn't matter whether I'm standing here or there, it always does the same uh, relative motion. But in our space, if you make a lane shift on a straight section, uh, it's different, that's just a straight line. But if you're on a curve, it makes this like elliptical arc. So in the state space, it actually looks totally different. So uh, we basically pre those in order to do that efficiently. Um, we also want to reuse work between all those different goals. Um, so to do that, we do, uh, uh, it's based on uh, ARA star. I don't know if you guys have uh, talked about those kind of uh, planners in this class. But basically, um, what it does is it comes up with a quick suboptimal solution. Um, and then continues to optimize the solution as time allows. So that's sort of the anytime property. And uh, the, the trick of, of it is that it can reuse work from previous iterations. So what it does is like a weighted A star search and then decreases the weights. Um, and like it has a way to reuse work so it, it doesn't do too much extra work. Um, there's a few weird things about this, which is that if your code is faster, you get better plans and you get better, your AI actually performs better. So this is something that was kind of interesting to deal with is like if you have one person on like a crappy phone and one person on a better phone, the person on the better phone will have like a harder AI opponent. But we, we found some ways to sort of mitigate that. Um, kind of interesting. So um, the overdrive overview. So, uh, so what does it take to do, right? I mean, uh, there's, I talked about some of the, like, the robotic stuff because that's the audience here, but there's a ton of things that go into this kind of a product. So I mean, at the bottom of the stack, you have like materials, right? Like, uh, you know, you're trying to solve a problem. This is what I think is so much fun about robotics and especially uh, at Anki is like, you're trying, say you're trying to solve a problem that the cars are uh, like sliding off the track too much. You know, you start with, you look at the materials. Okay. Yeah. Five minutes including, wanna okay. Take any I have like two slides left. Cool. So you have like materials. So like, what is the rubber made out of? What is the, what is the track made out of? Uh, you have the mechanical design and engineering. We do all this in-house. Um, you have the, the circuits on the 
cars. Then there's the low-level firmware to communicate with the drivers um, and the camera and all that sort of thing. Um, and then the application firmware, which is like the, the controller which runs on the car, the, uh, the scanning, all of that sort of code. Um, then there's communications to talk to the phone. Um, then the core robotics engine is uh, the thing which you know, exposes like where are the cars, what are they doing, what's happening. Um, on top of that, we can build our AI characters and the game, which is basically on top of all of this, there's what looks sort of like a normal video game. So you've got the, the mission, the characters, the story. Um, and then we have a mobile interface and a UI on top of that. So we have a bunch of people from like a mobile apps background. And we do uh, cloud services and analytics as well. Um, so we're hiring. We have internships and full-time jobs. Uh, we also have a second product, which I can't talk at all about, except that there's computer vision in it. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you guys, my email address is brad at Anki.com. So if you guys have any questions or you're interested in jobs or know anyone that might be, uh, definitely let me know. Up and they have a copy of the, mm -hmm. the game also, and yep. you both are playing together, but it's separate. Like, yeah, together. so the, the sort of dream there has always been like the dad who's away on his business trip, and you know he's playing with his son. Yeah. Um, so we've definitely thought about that. It's really hard with like I think with latency to do that right. But the the other thing that's really hard. I mean, video games solve that problem, right? But the problem is that in a video game, if you've ever seen lag in a video game where the character's here and then like jumps over here, right? We can't do that. So like we can try to make the two games line up with each other. But there's only so good of a job we could do. So I think the better approach would be to have one physical game and one where you're just like looking at another screen and it's virtual. But um, yeah, so it's certainly something we could do. It's just a lot of work, and we haven't deemed it worth worthwhile yet. But yeah, maybe. Yeah. Do you guys uh, do any like to make it hackable so that you can communicate? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, we do have an SDK. Uh, there's one out, out there right now. It's really low level. So it basically just exposes the, the messaging infrastructure between the car and the phone. So you can send it messages. You can set the lights. You can drive it around. Um, and you can get gobbledygook numbers back about where it is. But you can't really make any sense of that. Um, we're working on an SDK. Uh, we had an intern over the summer who got it like 95% done that would basically we'd give you like a library and a header that would allow you to you know, get the full position of the cars, you know, and, and do everything uh, that you wanted to on top of that. So that's definitely something that we're looking to release. Uh, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. I noticed that sometimes the packs go over each other. Is there any sense of which ones are on top? Or is uh, that's a great question. So yeah, so you, we, in the starter kit, we do ship you with like these little risers. And people also just, there's crazy stuff on YouTube with people building like crazy 3D tracks. Um, so, uh, the cars, the hardware on the cars didn't change the, the basic hardware from drive to overdrive. So we don't have any kind of accelerometer or any kind of direct sensing of that. Um, we do have a little like uh, research project going on to try to use the encoders um, to figure out that you're, and the motor torques to figure out that you're, or like the voltages to figure out that you're working harder and therefore probably going uphill. Um, we wound up not getting that working well enough for ship, but it's still something that we're looking into trying to map that. Um, so I, I think it can probably be done. But right now, we just have a, like a, we know the topology. And so we just arbitrarily pick one that we think is on top for display purposes. But there's no actual Z. It's just a 2D model right now. But yeah, it's something that we, I think, would be cool to do. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys.